All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to our capstone presentation today. Um, as you can see from the title of our slide, we did an energy audit of the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library and Museum in Stanton, Virginia. My name is Patrick Francis. My name is Sam Menchel. I'm Nolan Johnston. I'm Lindsay Pro. And our faculty advisor for this capstone experience was Professor Paul Goodall. So a little bit of an overview about what we'll present today and what we'll be discussing. Um, so we'll start off by talking about our clients down in Woodrow Wilson, down in Stanton. Um, we'll then go over a little bit about our background material and about uh, the background of energy auditing in general. We'll then move on to our approach and how we tackled each system, how we analyzed that, um, and how we got our data. And then we will recap with recommendations, move on to the future legacies of our project, um, and finally conclude with acknowledgments. So to begin, um, talking about our client a little bit, our client is the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library and Museum, the entire complex down in uh, Stanton, Virginia, as I stated. Um, this project started about in November of 2015 when Robin Van Zeldnick, the CEO of uh, Woodrow Wilson, re uh, reached out to James Madison University and re uh, requested to start a capstone experience. Um, from that, you, the four of us standing in front of you today jumped on board and decided to meet with her and uh, develop a project. Um, from our, develop, our meetings, we developed a series of three goals that um, we wanted to produce <coughs> this audit, or the outcome of this audit we wanted to have, uh, produce. The first was reduce the overall utility bills. This is just monetary, financially um, motivated um, to lower their basic operating costs and lower their um, overall monthly expenditures. Um, the second is to reduce their energy consumption which is the basic goal of any energy audit. And finally, we wanted to produce community outreach material for them to use and educate and enlighten their patrons that come and visit the museum, as well as to use it in future marketing campaigns um, to drum up business in the future. So here's a Google Earth view of the complex um, down in Stanton. Um, so first off, we have a library here. Um, this building is a lesser used building on the complex. It's home to many historical documents um, and archives, um, but again, it's not very uh, uh, very much used by patrons or staff. Um, the next building we're gonna talk, uh, I'll talk about is the museum. This is one of the major um, attractions of the entire complex. Um, the first floor and basement are actually exhibits from Woodrow Wilson's presidency, his life, um, and uh, everything he did. It's actually it's also home to the Woodrow Wilson's presidential car that he had during and after his time in office. Um, and then the second and third floor of that building is again more archives than office spaces. Um, from there we're going to move on to the Smith House right here. This is actually one of the main buildings of the complex. It's home to the visitor center, the gift <laughs> shop, um, as well as the majority of the offices for the Woodrow Wilson employees. Um, next is the Mance, uh, Mance right here. Um, that is actually the birthplace of Woodrow Wilson and the childhood home where he grew up. Um, this is the only building on the in the complex that is actually on the historic registry, so that kind of threw a couple of uh, red, uh, red tape into our project and uh, things we had to look at. Um, another interesting note um, before we get into the analysis of our project, this, uh, since the manse is so old and such, and it's a historic building on the registry, um, it does not actually have its own heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. Um, so it actually uses the um, HVAC system from the Smith House. So we actually analyze those two buildings as one. Um, and then finally, we have the carriage house here. Um, that is more, um, again, a seldom used building. That is um, primarily a workshop for facilities management, um, as well as another educational space. Okay, so here's just some brief background as to why our project is important in the greater context of things. So the energy crisis of 1970 was really the spark that ignited um, green technology and energy efficiency. So this crisis really centered around um, the shortage of fossil fuels during this time period and brought global attention to consumption methods, especially in developed and developing countries around the world. Um, the attention really focused on how long societies could continue to use and exploit non-renewable resources. And, um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of countries that have heavy reliance on fossil fuels, the United States being one of the biggest. Um, you know, uh, for the United States, fossil fuels have really been the cornerstone of economic growth for the past century. So this crisis is a really big turning point in history as far as the consumption <coughs> goes. And it led to, um, in the same decade that it was introduced, we have the National Energy Act, which was established in 1978 under the Jimmy Carter administration, actually a little 
a little after Woodrow's time, unfortunately, but uh, it eventually led to things that we have today, like ASHRAE, which was our main resource that we used for uh, connecting our audit. Um, ASHRAE is the American Society for Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, <coughs> and I'll touch upon how we use that right now. So the first step is to do an initial walkthrough, which is what we did. So um, we actually applied this to the entire complex all at once. So we went through and um, just figured out what um, what looked amiss to us at first glance. So this could be if there was um, no LEDs installed, things like that. Um, writing down uh, model numbers for HVAC units. And once we completed that, we did a beta audit at the Library and Research Center, which was pretty much just a way for us to um, rule out any imperfections we might have and just better improve our methodologies before we moved on to the more energy consuming buildings on the property. So um, the two energy, the two biggest energy consumers are the museum and the <coughs> Smith and the Man's House. Um, which is where we did our traditional audits following the beta audit, as well as the carriage house, which is um, pretty much negligible in most cases since it's a really uh, small and um, rarely used facility. So our systems approach for each one of these buildings was we analyzed the utilities, the HVAC, the lighting, the building envelope, the water, and the plug load. An important preliminary step in doing an energy audit is determining a baseline of energy usage for the buildings and <coughs> the buildings that you're auditing. What we did was we got the utility bill information from the museum staff. Um, <coughs> we put it in an Excel uh, format. This Excel file we are making available to them after our project so that they can continue to track their utility usage. Um, tracking, so you can see here's an example of how we did the electricity consumption, building by building, <coughs> as well as the natural gas consumption. Additionally, these spreadsheets have, a, uh, have summary tables that automatically update when more information is added. Um, here's just a couple examples, the museum and the carriage house, total, uh, total usage of each utility as well as the total cost per year. But additionally, this column over here is labeled EUI, that's the energy usage intensity. Um, that is basically the amount of energy that a building is using per year per square foot. And so we're using that as our um, benchmarking tool and I'll get to that in a minute. Here's just another thing Another thing you can do when you have all this utility information. Here's a graph of the electricity usage over the amount of time that we got bills from 2012 to 2016. Um, and this is all the buildings in the complex. The carriage house had the lowest energy usage and the library and research center had the second lowest. And then the Smith, and Man the Smith House and Mance and the museum uh, are using <coughs> most of the facility's energy. And when you have it out like this, you can notice trends and you can notice things like spikes. And when you have that data on hand, it makes it possible to deal with that spike in energy usage on a um, month by month basis. And so benchmarking, we use the energy usage intensity. The EPA has um, residential median measures for residential and office buildings. Um, their energy usage intensities at uh, 69 and 63 and that's measured in kilo BTUs per square foot per year. Um, and so the museum and the Smith and Mance house, <coughs> the Smith house and the Mance, uh, have fairly similar energy usage intensities to those. And since the museum and the Smith house and the Mance have all been um, reconstituted from residential buildings and now serve uh, to be as museum and office spaces, uh, we thought that these would be reasonable benchmarks to look at. And so it basically is telling us that they have fairly average energy usage. And if they continue to use the utility tracker that we give them, they'll be able to see that energy usage intensity decline as they implement more energy efficiency um, tactics. Okay, so for the HVAC, um, HVAC is heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Um, again, we followed the ASHRAE standards through the three level step-by-step uh, -step process. So the first step was the walkthrough analysis, as you can see here. Professor Goodall reading aloud some uh, model numbers to us so we could do some further uh, analysis into um, the efficiency of those units when they were installed, things like that. Um, and then we did, once we completed that, we did a more detailed analysis, which is level two, um, the energy survey analysis. So our main, um, our main emphasis was to find the C ratings, and SEER is a seasonal energy efficiency ratio. Um, it's measured in BTUs per watt hour, and it's pretty much a depiction of the ratio between um, cooling and energy consumption for one unit. Um, once we determined that, we compared that to the C ratings for units also on the property and also on the market that we could find. And um, level three was our uh, most detailed analysis. So that was 
analysis of capital intensive modifications. So pretty much just um, if we could determine if there were higher CO ratings in place of the lower CO rating units, how that would affect the energy consumption for each building and also the complex as a whole. We also looked at monitoring, which um, has a lot to do with just maintenance, um, proper monitoring, make sure that there's um, no unnecessary energy consumption for the HVAC units. If um, there's a building that's free, um, not frequently used and uses a lot of energy, that would be something to look into. Um, also, changing and monitoring thermostats. Um, there's filters for thermostats, so you'd have to change those regularly. Um, and also, it's important to note um, humidity and temperature control in a traditional audit, but it was pretty much not something we had to um, go too deeply into, especially because the museum and library does have <coughs> historical documents on the premises. There's already um, really good practices being held with the humidity and temperature control within those buildings, so we don't have to look too deeply into that. So um, I know it's hard to see in the back especially, but this is just a spreadsheet of the data we collected for the HVAC. So up here in this section is a library and research center, which is where we conduct our beta audit. Um, pretty much what we determined is that the library and research center has the most recent installations as far as HVAC goes, so we didn't have to um, go too deeply into that, but I'll touch upon how we um, analyze that building in particular in a little bit. And all of this here, from here down, is all for the museum, so you can see how um, it's really no wonder why it consumes the most energy out of all the buildings. Um, it clearly has the most, um, the most units. And then all of this is the Smith and the Mance. Um, it's similar to the museum, has a few less units, as you can see here, um, which makes it the second most energy consuming for HVAC. And then down here, as I mentioned, the carriage house was um, pretty negligible. There's not really, um, there are, could be some improvements made, but um, eventually we're gonna recommend that they do not um, spend the money on that as far, it, it would be better to invest in the more energy consuming <coughs> buildings pretty much. So just the summary of the data I just showed you, um, again, the Library and Research Center is where we conduct our beta audit. It has two heat pumps, um, both operating with R410A um, refrigerant, which is the most recent refrigerant you can get on the market. Um, it's more efficient and um, more healthy for the environment than other, um, than other refrigerants. As you can see here, the museum and the Smith and the Mance um, use R22 refrigerants. That is something you can't really, can't really get on the market anymore. It's been outlawed um, following the Montreal Protocol. It's a CFC, <laughs> so it's ozone depleting. Um, it's not, not good for the environment. It's also less efficient than the um, refrigerant you see in the library and research center up there. So um, yeah, these, these two buildings here are um, a, a combination between electric and natural gas. Um, you can go to the next slide. So um, eventually our recommendations are um, to pretty much just proper manage the thermostats, um, set lower temperatures in the HVAC units, and monitor, again, maintenance of the thermostats. Um, and um, eventually we're going to replace the old units with more efficient ones, but only once the ones that are currently in place fail. Um, as you can see up here, we have um, some statistics as how much they save, or how much they spend on um, electricity each month for some of the units. So. There's a boiler in the Smith and the Mance that we determined um, with the help of David Cangria at Southern Air runs at 80% efficiency. So they spend just over $460 per winter month um, to use that boiler, and that was um, an average over a two year span. <coughs> and then the units in the Smith and Mance also operate just under $240 um, per month on electricity, and that's just for heating and cooling costs. So that's just over um, $2,800 per year in perspective. Um, the museum, again, um, consumes a bit more, so the cost is higher, um, just under $320 on electricity each month for heating and cooling, which is, again, um, it's about $3,800 per year uh, for heating and cooling. <coughs> so, um, yeah, so going back to the um, replacing those units, it would be, it'd be wise for the museum to have a proper management plan of how they plan to pay for those units. It is very costly. Um, it would be best for them to implement uh, more efficient units. As you can see here, the C ratings for the Smith and the uh, Mass and Museum fall in this range over here between 9 and 10. So this is a um, national average pretty much. So it's a little lower for Virginia in particular. This is skewed mainly, I guess, due to states like um, Florida and Texas, the warmer states, things like that. So this kind of just puts into perspective how much they will save eventually when they replace those units. So uh, 10 CR rating going to a 16 CR rating, you could save 
it's about 30% typically nationwide. So it will eventually be wise for them to make that investment. Um, so again, we plan that they put money aside now or they can just pretty much plan um, and just spend all that money at once once they do eventually fail. Either that could be when they run out of the R22 refrigerant, since it is, you can't get on the market anymore, they would have to replace the units um, once, once that refrigerant runs out, as well as the air handlers with those units. Um, yes, that's our, that's our main recommendation for HVAC. Um, so the next system we're gonna talk about is the lighting. Um, again, as with ASHRAE tier one auditing, this is part of the walkthrough analysis. Um, so what we did, we walked through every single building, every single room in the entire complex, and individually counted every single light bulb. Um, so at, as shown in the chart on the right there, that's an example of one of our tabulated data. This is actually from our beta audit of the Library and Research Center. Um, so in this audit and in this uh, data, data collection, we collected the location, the number of bulbs, the type of bulb, the wattage of each specific bulb, and then estimated the general usage um, based on uh, estimations and recommendations from our contact, Gary, um, who was the facilities manager at the time. Um, and then as you can see in the chart on the left, that is the total number of light bulbs um, tabulated by each building and <coughs> each type. Um, so as you can see, the overall arching theme and majority of the light bulbs, or the bulbs used um, in the entire complex are the um, 40 watt incandescent as well as the 40 watt fluorescent tube lighting. Um, however, you can also see in the table that the 8 watt LED has started to make a comeback from the museum. This is from one of our uh, preliminary meetings with uh, Robin and the rest of the staff. Um, we made some minor suggestions as far as how to generally save energy and generally save money and this was one of those recommendations kind of just throwing it out without actually doing any of the analysis like, oh yeah, you can change the LED and it'll save you money. They got excited and started doing that in the first floor in the basement of the museum. So that kind of skewed our numbers a little bit, um, but it still worked out. Um, so from there, once we had all the data tape ta uh, tabulated, we then uh, completed <coughs> discount payback analyses. So as you can see here in the first one on the top left of the Library and Research Center, this was from our beta audit. <coughs> um, if you'll remember, as I was describing the complex, the library is a lesser used building. Um, so we uh, determined that it was only, or estimated that it was used about three hours per day for about five days per week, on average for the total lighting in the building. Um, we did an analysis to change 40 watt, um, the 40 watt bulbs to eight watt LEDs. Um, and as you can see from the chart there, they can save, uh, they have the potential to save $144 just on energy savings per year. Um, and with that initial investment in that uh, savings, they could would be able to um, pay for for the system in the library itself in about 64 months. The second analysis we did was of the museum, again doing the 40 watt to 8 watt LED. However, in this building, since it was more widely used, we assumed uh, nine hours per day, but again, five days per week. Um, at set, with the much more large scale of the building, you can see that there's a greater uh, number in total savings in about $960, um, again, in energy savings each year. Um, so that gave it a much shorter payback period of about 16 months. Um, from there, we moved on to the uh, Manson Smith House. Um, again, this was one of the more widely used buildings, so we again assumed nine hours per day of use for five days per week, um, and again, changing the 40-watt bulbs to 8-watt LEDs. Um, here we saw uh, potential savings, energy savings of about $700 per year, um, which would give a discounted payback period of about 15 months. Um, then finally, based on recommendations after talking to some of the Woodrow Wilson employees, um, the gift shop manager actually talked to us about how he thought it was wasteful, about how the lights in the gift shop were always on and always producing heat. So we actually decided to take a uh, particular look at those and show that analysis. Um, so in the gift shop, they actually have 13 65 watt halogen bulbs um, that are on nine hours a day, all day, every day for the most part. Um, so we looked into switching those to 11 watt LED floodlights. Um, and with that, we again assumed nine hours per day for five days a week, just as the other um, previous two analyses. Um, this gave a larger payback of about $375 um, for considering the scale of the analysis, um, which gave a very, very short payback period of about nine months. <coughs> so with our overall recommendations for lighting, um, we have the obvious behavioral changes that we can make with manual techniques such as turning off lights when you're not in the room or turning off 
lights in a building when the building is in between tours or um, in between uses. Um, the other part of that uh, behavioral management, we could all, we're also recommending that they could potentially um, implement automated systems such as motion sensors in rooms so that lights are turned off and only turn on when somebody walks into the room um, or potentially timers so that on scheduled tours that the build, it turns on like five minutes before the tour and will turn off um, for a set period of time after the fact. Um, we're also suggesting that since we saw that large, such a large payback or such a large savings and such a quick payback for the Smith House gift shop, we're actually suggest or recommending that they immediately change those lights from uh, the 65 watt halogens to the 11 watt LED floodlights. And then similarly to the HVAC systems, um, even though some of these systems were longer payback periods for the lighting, we're actually recommending that they, um, in the interest of saving money and saving um, energy for the audit, um, that they replace the lighting in the entire complex to all LED systems. The next system that we analyzed was the building envelope, which <coughs> includes basically everything within the barrier between the building and the outside environment. So this includes walls, windows, <coughs> um, doors, chimneys, etc. Um, so the um, simplest method we used was hand testing, where we simply just placed our hand over vents to make sure that um, air was coming out and it was actually being used. The second method we used was using a FLIR FLIR thermal imaging camera, and we have two of these images on the left. The first one is a picture showing the bottom of a door, and you can tell that the purple area indicates cooler temperatures, while the orange and yellow indicate warmer temperatures. So this, you can see the high temperature differential between the two. And this picture was also taken in January, so it could indicate cool air moving uh, from the outside of the building um, into the building under the door. And the second image is showing a vent, and you can see heat escaping from the vent as well as moving throughout the ductwork underneath the floorboard. The third approach we took was using a heat flux sensor to measure the R values of the windows and walls throughout the building. And in a standard commercial audit, they might use multiple sensors to measure multiple R values between the different windows and walls in the same building. However, we only had access to one, and so this seemed impractical. So we decided that um, just measuring one window and one wall in each building was sufficient for our project. And this picture on the right is showing the heat flux sensor and it's set up when it's collecting data. So this is a table of the R values that we measured. Um, the library we did in our beta audit <coughs> so since this was the first time we were using the equipment, um, the values are slightly higher than the rest of them. And we also took measurements in the museum and Smith House. Um, and we had an emphasis on the museum garage, which um, has the Woodrow Wilson's old car in it. And it's kind of unique to the museum because it's on display for passerbys by people passing by. Um, <laughs> because um, it has a wall of windows, so you can see it as you're passing. And Energy Star recommends that windows should have a R value of three or higher, and the Department of Energy recommends that walls have a R value of approximately 13 to 15. So you can see that the walls are well within um, this range, as well as some being above this. Um, however, the windows are slightly lower than three. Um, so our recommendations for Woodrow Wilson would be implementing um, low-cost initiatives such as weather stripping and closing open areas that aren't in use. We did a simple payback period for seeing if it was feasible to replace all the windows within the different buildings. However, this payback was way too big and so we did not recommend this. And we also didn't recommend that, um, that the walls be um, adding insulation or just using a different building material to get that higher R value. Um, one because the current when the current walls um, are already within the recommended R values, and also replacing the walls with different building material would be very disruptive. And um, and the buildings also do have historical significance, especially the manse, which is on the historical registry. Another aspect of energy that we looked at was the plug lid. 
Plug load is anything that is <coughs> anything that's drawing power plugged in and it excludes lighting. In a large commercial energy audit where you're looking at an office building with dozens or hundreds of computers, um, making changes and replacements can lead to significant savings. However, due to the fact that the Woodrow Wilson Museum complex has relatively few um, power drawing uh, appliances and computers like that, we're not recommending that they make changes as the, uh, the savings that they would find would be few and the payback periods would be long. Uh, the water usage in the Woodrow Wilson Music, the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library and Museum uh, complex is very low. Uh, the there have been a few spikes looking at the utility information during the spring, which we determined to be due to gardening. However, as far as indoor water use, the water heaters in all the buildings were Energy Star certified at the time that they were installed, and so there are currently more efficient water heater systems on the market, but any increases in efficiencies would be <coughs> fairly small and any savings made from changing them would be small as well. So we're not recommending that they change those systems either. So just to reiterate some recommendations for the four major systems that we would see the most payback with. Um, for utilities, we recommend <coughs> updating the utility tracker that we'll be providing for them every month and investigating any high energy usages they see from utility bills. Uh, for HVAC, we recommend proper management of thermostats as well as replacing old units with more efficient ones as they fail, as well as <coughs> focusing on the maintenance of the HVAC systems themselves. And for lighting, we recommend implementing lighting reduction methods as well as replacing the current system with LED bulbs once the current systems fail. And for building envelope, we recommend investing in low-cost initiatives such as weather stripping and um, closing off areas, open areas that aren't in use. So from here we want to talk about a little bit about our future work and the legacy that our capstone is leaving. Um, so Levi Bain is actually proposing a capstone to Woodrow Wilson in the coming weeks um, about continuing our project and continuing um, to implement our recommendations. Um, so that's one of the major focuses is implementing our recommendations that we've made or we'll, we will make to Woodrow Wilson next week. Um, and he'll do this by through a general consulting role um, with JMU. Um, he'll work to try to finance and find cheaper systems that they can install and implement in the facilities and in the complex, as well as potentially um, working with grant proposals and grant writing to find a little extra money for, to help them out um, with installing these changes. Um, Levi is also planning to look a little bit into green energy purchasing. Um, as green energy production on uh, the, in the complex is relatively infeasible um, just due to the sheer power draw and the sheer amount of energy that the uh, complex uses. Um, and finally, he will continue our, uh, even though that was one of our main goals, we were able to provide um, one poster to um, Woodrow Wilson for their guests and patrons to see as well as their staff. Um, however, Levi is what would uh, we'll be planning to continue this and provide more educational outreach opportunities um, for the community and for marketing campaigns. Yeah, we want to thank everybody who helped us make this possible. I want to thank Professor Goodall, who's our advisor, who's there for us every step of the way. I want to thank Dr. Chen. Without his mechanical expertise, we would not have been able to get the heat flux sensors working, um, and we wouldn't have been able to get our hands on one of those FLIR cameras. Uh, I want to thank Robin von Seldenek, the CEO of the Woodrow Wilson Museum Foundation. She invited us there, and she was very welcoming and helpful to us the entire time, as well as uh, the other employees of the Woodrow Wilson Museum Foundation. I thank An Andrew Phillips, the museum curator. He was very helpful to us anytime we needed to be, anytime we were there and we didn't have somebody to help, he was willing to give us a hand and show us around. Gary Bartley, the um, facility <coughs> manager, he helped us out. He showed us around. He was our point of contact for a long time. And uh, we also want to thank Karen Dodson, who picked up as our point of contact this past semester. Uh, I want to thank uh, industry professionals that we got in contact with. We talked to Sustainable Building Partners. That's some ISAT alumni who do energy auditing in Northern Virginia. They helped us out when we were just starting, as well as um, Abe Kaufman, the sustainability coordinator here at JMU. He gave us a lot of pointers when we were, when we were uh, getting going on our project. Um, 
as well as David Cangria of Southern Air. He helped us out a lot with the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. And uh, I want to thank all our family and friends who showed up. And I want to thank you guys for doing this project. <laughs> Let's I got a question for you. Yes. Uh, looking at the envelope, and, and I'm, this is very selfish because I have an 1830s house myself, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm conflicted because you're looking at a historic building. Mm -hmm. Probably, I, I can't tell, but I imagine some or most of the windows are original to the house, and so they are a, a historic resource. You know, I've, I had somebody say, well, you can improve your house a lot. Just take out all those old hand, you know, plain windows, and, mm -hmm. you know, hell no. I buried him in the back pasture, right? <laughs> so, the question for you though, it, it, did you look at alternatives, for example, are there now in the market any better storm window uh, devices you can purchase that, that somehow maintain some of the benefits of the historic window itself, but then produ produce some insulating value? Um, we didn't look specifically oh. into that, we looked, what? They actually, they actually have storm windows in okay. place, and that's why they have such high R values as they do. Um, but they do have the original historic original windows in each uh, location in each building um, and they've added that extra layer of storm, uh, storm window on top of that on the exterior um, so these measurements were through both windows right but I'm wondering I mean I, I have storm windows too but they were put on in the 60s mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm guessing things have improved probably quite a lot since then maybe I don't know if you had a chance to look at any of the technology that might be out for for just like retrofitting the HVAC system perhaps enhancing modern, more modern technologies for that. A lot of them are single pane, so we focused on kind of increasing to like double pane. The storm windows, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that was our main focus. Um, but, yeah. So the uh, the window in the garage, it is a single pane, right? It is, yeah, I believe yes. so, yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm. But they need like to have it like functioning, so they, they actually take the car out, so they need the, the windows to like open up so they could actually get the car out of the facility so we really didn't want to mess too much with that we didn't right. want to like decrease the functionality of the museum so we kind of just decided to leave that <coughs> so you said that the gift shop is using halogen lights I mean correct me if I'm wrong but those get really hot correct so if you were to replace those wouldn't that essentially like help you with uh, like your HVAC like energy consumption as well uh, like uh, two birds and one stone um, it wouldn't the, they yeah, not make it wouldn't in the summer but um, it would um, with that, it would definitely um, in potentially increase the heating load in the winter. However, it would obviously decrease the um, <coughs> cooling load in the uh, summer. Um, however, we believed and assumed that it would be neg negligible, um, that difference in the heating and um, HVAC systems. So we didn't really look a whole lot into that aspect of it, but more so just the energy savings of it. Uh, I think it's great work. Uh, one thing is, if you look at, maybe I came here a bit late, I missed it. Uh, if you look at the park factor of their electrical system, then that can be something you know, uh, can be corrected by implementing some of the factors. And that, that doesn't really help from a safety amount of money. Uh, you can look at that. For just electricity consumption overall, you mean? or? Uh, so, park factor is, uh, is a difference between the uh, current power, mm -hmm. uh, between the low power divided by the uh, by the part a part of power. So that's the power you know, factor. circuit and also the load on the, the fish uh, on the work itself. Fish. So, yeah. No, I don't think although I don't think we actually did really look at the power factor in analyzing the electricity usage. You know. So this is probably something can do in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Levi. Levi, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Levi. <laughs> One thing that struck me as anomalous is uh, the highest wattage incandescent bulbs you found in there were 40 watts. For the you got office yes. spaces in here. Who uses a 40 watt illumination in their office space? Um, actually, a lot of the office spaces were lit by natural light by windows. So the um, they were combined with the 40 watt incandescent bulb as well as the 40 watt um, fluorescent tubing overhead. Um, so the combination between the natural light, the fluorescent lighting, led to only 40 watt bulbs. So was that a conscious effort on their part in the, in the past to try to reduce their energy um, consumption? I do not know if that was their conscious effort or if that was just what they happened to buy and happened to install at the time they needed to. Most people have 40 watt in their oven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? <laughs>